Book two, chapter two of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book two, chapter two, Scholasticism and the Classics, Luther's piety, his discovery of a Bible, his sickness, the thunderstorm, his entrance into a convent luther had attained his eighteenth year he had tasted the pleasures of literature and burning with eagerness to learn he sighed after a university and longed to repair to one of those fountains of science at which he might quench his thirst for knowledge his father wished him to study law and already saw him filling an honourable station among his fellow-citizens gaining the favour of princes and making a figure on the theatre of the world it was resolved that the young student should repair to erfurt luther arrived at this university in the year fifteen hundred and one jadocus surnamed the doctor of the isenach was then teaching the scholastic philosophy with much success melancthon regrets that the only thing then taught at erfurt should have been a dialectics bristling with difficulties he thinks that if luther had found other professors there if he had been trained in the milder and calmer discipline of true philosophy it might have moderated and softened the vehemence of his nature the new scholar began to study the philosophy of the middle ages in the writings of occam scotus bonaventura and thomas aquinas at a later period he had a thorough disgust for all this scholasticism the very name of aristotle pronounced in his hearing filled him with indignation he even went to the length of saying that if aristotle was not a man he would have no hesitation in taking him for the devil but his mind in its eagerness for learning stood in need of better nourishment and he began to study the splendid monuments of antiquity the writings of cicero and virgil and the other classics he was not contented like the common run of students with committing the productions of these writers to memory he endeavoured above all to enter into their thoughts to imbue himself with the spirit which animated them to appropriate their wisdom to comprehend the end of their writings and enrich his understanding with their weighty sentiments and brilliant images he often put questions to his professors and soon outstripped his fellow-students possessed of a retentive memory and a fertile imagination whatever he read or heard remained ever after present to his mind as if he had actually seen it so shone luther in his youth the whole university says melancthon admired his genius but even at that period this young man of eighteen did not confine his labours to the cultivation of his intellect he had that serious thought that uplifted heart which god bestows on those whom he destines to be his most faithful servants luther felt that he was dependent on god a simple yet powerful conviction the source at once of profound humility and great achievements he fervently invoked the divine blessing on his labours every morning he began the day with prayer then he went to church and on his return set to study losing not a moment during the course of the day to pray well he was wont to say is more than the half of my study every moment which the young student could spare from his academical labours was spent in the library of the university books were still rare and he felt it a great privilege to be able to avail himself of the treasures amassed in this vast collection one day he had then been two years at erfurt and was twenty years of age he opens several books of the library one after the other to see who their authors were one of the volumes which he opens in its turn attracts his attention he has never before seen one like it he reads the title it is a bible a rare book at that time unknown his interest is strongly excited he is perfectly astonished to find in this volume anything more than those fragments of gospels and epistles which the church has selected to be read publicly in the churches every sabbath day hitherto he had believed that these formed the whole word of god 
but here are so many pages chapters and books of which he had no idea his heart beats as he holds in his hand all this divinely inspired scripture and he turns over all these divine leaves with feelings which cannot be described the first page on which he fixes his attention tells him the story of hannah and young samuel he reads and his soul is filled with joy to overflowing the child whom his parents lend to jehovah for all the days of his life the song of hannah in which she declares that the lord lifts up the poor from the dust and the needy from the dunghill that he may set him with princes young samuel growing up in the presence of the lord the whole of this history the whole of the volume which he has discovered make him feel in a way he has never done before he returns home his heart full oh thinks he would it please god one day to give me such a book for my own luther as yet did not know either greek or hebrew for it is not probable that he studied these languages during the first two or three years of his residence at the university the bible which had so overjoyed him was in latin soon returning to his treasure in the library he reads and re-reads and in his astonishment and joy returns to read again the first rays of a new truth were then dawning upon him in this way god has put him in possession of his word he has discovered the book of which he is one day to give his countrymen that admirable translation in which germany has now for three centuries perused the oracles of god it was perhaps the first time that any hand had taken down this precious volume from the place which it occupied in the library of erfurt this book lying on the unknown shelves of an obscure chamber is to become the book of life to a whole people the reformation was hid in that bible this happened the same year that luther obtained his first academical degree viz that of bachelor the excessive fatigue which he had undergone in preparing for his trials brought on a dangerous illness death seemed to be approaching and solemn thoughts occupied his mind he believed that his earthly course was about to terminate there was a general lamentation for the young man what a pity to see so many hopes so soon extinguished several friends came to visit him in his sickness among others a priest a venerable old man who had with interest followed the student of mansfeld in his labours and academic life luther was unable to conceal the thought which agitated him soon said he i will be called away from this world but the old man kindly replied my dear bachelor take courage you will not die of this illness our god will yet make you a man who in his turn will console many other men for god lays his cross on him whom he loves and those who bear it patiently acquire much wisdom these words made a deep impression on the sick youth when so near death he hears the lips of a priest reminding him that god as samuel's mother had said lifts up the miserable the old man has poured sweet consolation into his heart and revived his spirits he will never forget him this was the first prediction that the doctor heard says mathesius luther's friend who relates the fact and he often mentioned it it is easy to understand what mathesius means by calling it a prediction when luther recovered something within him had undergone a change the bible his illness and the words of the old priest seemed to have made a new appeal to him as yet however there was nothing decided in his mind he continued his studies and in fifteen hundred and five took his degree of master of arts or doctor in philosophy the university of erfurt was then the most celebrated in germany the others in comparison with it being only inferior schools the ceremony was as usual performed with great pomp a procession with torches came to do homage to luther the fate was superb and all was joy luther encouraged perhaps by these honours was disposed to devote himself entirely to law agreeably to his father's wish but god willed otherwise while luther was occupied with other studies 
while he began to teach the physics and ethics of aristotle and other branches of philosophy his heart ceased not to cry to him that piety was the one thing needful and that he ought above all to make sure of his salvation he was aware of the displeasure which god testifies against sin he remembered the punishments which he denounces against the sinner and he asked himself in fear whether he was sure of possessing the divine favour his conscience answered no his character was prompt and decided he resolved to do all that might be necessary to give him a sure hope of immortality two events which happened in succession shook his soul and precipitated his determination among his friends at the university was one named alexis with whom he was very intimate one morning it was rumoured in erfurt that alexis had been assassinated deeply moved at the sudden loss of his friend he puts the question to himself what would become of me were i called thus suddenly the question fills him with the greatest dismay this was in the summer of fifteen hundred and five luther left at liberty by the ordinary recess of the university resolved on a journey to mansfeld to revisit the loved abodes of his infancy and embrace his parents perhaps he also wished to open his heart to his father and sound him as to the design which was beginning to form in his mind and obtain a consent to his embracing another calling he foresaw all the difficulties which awaited him the indolent habits of the majority of priests displeased the active minor of mansfeld besides ecclesiastics were little esteemed in the world most of them had but scanty incomes and the father who had made many sacrifices to maintain his son at the university and who saw him at twenty a public teacher in a celebrated school was not disposed to renounce the hopes which his pride was cherishing we know not what passed during luther's visit at mansfeld perhaps the decided wish of his father made him afraid to open his heart to him he again quitted the paternal roof to go and take his seat on the benches of the university and had reached within a short distance of erfurt when he was overtaken by one of those violent storms which are not unfrequent among these mountains the thunder bursts and strikes close by his side luther throws himself on his knees it may be his hour is come death judgment and eternity surround him with all their terrors and speak to him with a voice which he can no longer resist wrapped in agony and in the terror of death as he himself describes it he makes a vow if he is delivered from this danger to abandon the world and give himself entirely to god after he had risen from the ground still continuing to see that death must one day overtake him he examines himself seriously and asks what he ought to do the thoughts which formerly agitated him return with full force he has endeavoured it is true to fulfil all his duties but in what state is his soul can he appear with a polluted heart before the tribunal of a god so greatly to be feared he must become holy and accordingly he now thirsts for holiness as he had thirsted for science but where is it to be found how shall he acquire it the university has furnished him with the means of satisfying his desire of knowledge who will extinguish the agony the flame which is consuming him to what school of holiness must he bend his steps he will go into a cloister the monastic life will save him how often has he heard tell of its power to transform a heart to sanctify a sinner to make a man perfect he will enter a monastic order he will then become holy and in that way secure eternal life such was the event which changed the calling and all the destinies of luther we here recognize the finger of god it was his mighty hand which threw down on the high road this young master of arts this candidate for the bar this future lawyer in order to give an entirely new direction to his life rubianus one of luther's friends wrote to him at a later period divine providence had a view to what you were one day to become when as you were returning from your parents the fire of heaven made you fall to the ground like another paul near the town of erfurt 
and carrying you off from our society threw you into the order of augustine analogous circumstances thus signalized the conversion of paul and luther the two greatest instruments which divine providence has employed in the two greatest revolutions which have taken place upon the earth luther again enters erfurt his resolution is immovable and yet it is not without a pang that he is going to break ties which are dear to him he gives no hint to any one of his intentions but one evening he invites his friends in the university to a cheerful and frugal repast music once more enlivens their social intercourse it is luther's adieu to the world henceforth instead of those loved companions of pleasure and toil monks instead of those cheerful and intellectual conversations the silence of the cloister instead of that enchanting music the grave notes of the tranquil chapel god demands it all must be sacrificed yet for this last time once more the joys of youth his friends are full of glee luther even leads them on but at the moment when they are abandoning themselves to mirth and frolic the young man becomes unable any longer to restrain the serious thoughts which occupy his heart he speaks he makes known his intention to his astonished friends who endeavour but in vain to combat it that same night luther afraid perhaps of importunate solicitation quits his lodgings leaving behind him all his effects and all his books with the exception of virgil and plautus as yet he had no bible virgil and plautus epic and comedy singular representation of luther's mind in fact there was in him a whole epic a beautiful splendid and sublime poem but being naturally inclined to gaiety pleasantry and broad humour he mingled more than one familiar trait with the solemn and magnificent groundwork of his life furnished with these two books he proceeds alone in the dark to the convent of the eremites of st augustine and asks to be received the door opens and closes and he is separated for ever from his parents his fellow students and the world this took place on the seventeenth of august fifteen hundred and five when luther's age was twenty-one years and nine months End of Book Two, Chapter Two. Book Two, Chapter Three of the History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three His Father's Anger, Servile Employments, His Studies, the bible hebrew and greek his agony during mass useless observances luther in a faint at length he was with god his soul was in safety this holiness so earnestly longed for he was now to find at the sight of this young doctor the monks were all admiration and extolled him for his courage and contempt of the world luther meanwhile did not forget his friends he wrote to take leave of them and the world and the next day dispatched these letters with the clothes he had hitherto worn and his diploma of master of arts which he returned to the university that nothing might in future remind him of the world which he had abandoned his friends at erfurt were thunderstruck must so distinguished a genius go and hide himself in this monastic life more properly a kind of death in deep sorrow they hastened to the convent in the hope of inducing luther to retrace the distressing step which he had taken but all was useless the gates were closed and a month passed before any one was permitted to see or speak to the new monk luther had hastened to acquaint his parents with the great change which had just occurred in his life his father was thunderstruck he trembled for his son so luther himself informs us in his book on monastic vows which he dedicated to his father his weakness his youth the ardour of his passions 
everything in short made him fear that after the first moment of enthusiasm the indolence of the cloister would make the youth fall either into despair or into grievous faults he knew that this mode of life had proved fatal to many besides the counsellor minor of mansfeld had other views for his son he was proposing a rich and honourable marriage for him and lo all his ambitious projects are in one night overthrown by this imprudent action john wrote his son a very angry letter in which as luther himself tells us he thou'd him whereas he had ewed him ever since he had taken his degree of master of arts he withdrew all his favour from him and declared him disinherited of a father's affection in vain did the friends of john luther and doubtless his wife also endeavour to mollify him in vain did they say to him if you are willing to make some sacrifice to god let it be the best and dearest thing that you have your son your isaac the inexorable counsellor of mansfeld would hear nothing some time after the statement is given by luther in a sermon which he preached at wittemberg twentieth of january fifteen forty four the plague broke out and deprived john luther of two of his sons on the back of these bereavements while the father's heart was torn with grief some one came and told him the monk of erfurt also is dead his friends took advantage of the circumstance to bring back the father's heart to the novice if it is a false alarm said they at least sanctify your affliction by consenting sincerely to your son's being a monk well well replied john luther his heart broken and still half rebellious and god grant him all success at a later period when luther who had been reconciled to his father told him of the event which had led him to rush into monastic orders god grant replied the honest miner that what you took for a sign from heaven may not have been only a phantom of the devil at this time luther was not in possession of that which was afterwards to make him the reformer of the church his entrance into the convent proves this it was an action done in the spirit of an age out of which he was soon to be instrumental in raising the church though destined to become the teacher of the world he was still its servile imitator a new stone was placed on the edifice of superstition by the very hand which was soon to overturn it luther was seeking salvation in himself in human practices and observances not knowing that salvation is holy of god he was seeking his own righteousness and his own glory and overlooking the righteousness and glory of the lord but what he as yet knew not he soon afterwards learned that immense change which substituted god and his wisdom in his heart for the world and its traditions and which prepared the mighty revolution of which he was the most illustrious instrument took place in the cloister of erfurt martin luther on entering the convent changed his name to that of augustine the monks had received him with joy it was no small satisfaction to their self-love to see the university abandoned for a house of their order and that by one of the most distinguished teachers nevertheless they treated him harshly and assigned him the meanest tasks they wished to humble the doctor of philosophy and teach him that his science did not raise him above his brethren they thought moreover they would thus prevent him from spending his time in studies from which the convent could not reap any advantage the c devant master of arts behoved to perform the functions of watchman to open and shut the gates wind up the clocks sweep the church and clean up the rooms then when the poor monk who was at once porter sacristan and household servant to the cloister had finished his task cum sacu per civitatem to the town with the bag exclaimed the friars and then with his bread bag on his shoulders he walked up and down over all the streets of erfurt begging from house to house obliged perhaps to present himself at the doors of those who had been his friends or inferiors on his return he had either to shut himself up in a low narrow cell looking out on a plot only a few yards in extent or to resume his menial offices 
but he submitted to all disposed by temperament to give himself entirely to whatever he undertook when he turned monk he did it with his whole soul how moreover could he think of sparing his body or of having regard to what might satisfy the flesh that was not the way to acquire the humility and holiness in quest of which he had come within the walls of the cloister the poor monk worn out with fatigue was eager to seize any moment which he could steal from his servile occupations and devote it to the acquisition of knowledge gladly did he retire into a corner and give himself up to his beloved studies but the friars soon found him out gathered around him grumbled at him and pushed him away to his labours saying along along it is not by studying but by begging bread corn eggs flesh fish and money that a friar makes himself useful to his convent luther submitted laid aside his books and again took up his bag far from repenting of having subjected himself to such a yoke his wish was to bring it to a successful result at this period the inflexible perseverance with which he ever after followed out the resolutions which he had once formed began to be developed the resistance which he made to rude assaults gave strong energy to his will god exercised him in small things that he might be able to stand firm in great things besides in preparing to deliver his age from the miserable superstitions under which it groaned it was necessary that he should feel the weight of them in order to empty the cup he behoved to drink it to the dregs this severe apprenticeship however did not last so long as luther might have feared the prior of the convent on the intercession of the university of which luther was a member relieved him from the mean functions which had been imposed upon him and the young monk resumed his studies with new zeal the writings of the fathers particularly those of augustine engaged his attention the commentary of this illustrious doctor on the psalms and his treatise on the letter and the spirit being his special favourites nothing struck him more than the sentiments of this father on the corruption of the human will and on divine grace his own experience convincing him of the reality of this corruption and the necessity of this grace the words of augustine found a ready response in his heart and could he have been of any other school than that of jesus christ it had doubtless been the school of the doctor of hippo the works of peter daly and gabriel beale he almost knew by heart he was struck with the remark of the former that had not the church decided otherwise it would have been much better to admit that in the lord's supper bread and wine are truly received and not mere accidents he likewise studied carefully the theologians ockham and gerson who both expressed themselves so freely on the authority of the popes to this reading he joined other exercises in public discussions he was heard unravelling the most complicated reasonings and winding his way through labyrinths where others could find no outlet all who heard him were filled with admiration but he had entered the cloister not to acquire the reputation of a great genius but in quest of the food of piety these labours he accordingly regarded as supernumerary but the thing in which he delighted above all others was to draw wisdom at the pure fountain of the word of god in the convent he found a bible fastened to a chain and was ever returning to this chained bible he had a very imperfect comprehension of the word but still it was his most pleasant reading sometimes he spent a whole day in meditating on a single passage at other times he learned passages of the prophets by heart his great desire was that the writings of the apostles and prophets might help to give him a knowledge of the will of god increase the fear which he had for his name and nourish his faith by the sure testimony of the word apparently at this period he began to study the scriptures in the original tongues and thereby lay the foundation of the most perfect and the most useful of his labours the translation of the bible he used a hebrew lexicon which reuchlin had just published 
his first guide was probably john langer a friar of the convent versed in greek and hebrew with whom he always maintained a close intimacy he also made great use of the learned commentaries of nicholas lyra who died in thirteen forty and hence the saying of flug afterwards bishop of naumburg had not lyra played the lyre luther had never danced see si lyra known lyraset lutherus known saltaset the young monk studied so closely and ardently that he often omitted to say his hours during two or three weeks then becoming alarmed at the thought of having transgressed the rules of his order he shut himself up to make amends for his negligence and commenced conscientiously repeating all the omitted hours without thinking of meat or drink on one occasion his sleep went from him for seven weeks earnestly intent on acquiring the holiness in quest of which he had entered the cloister luther addicted himself to the ascetic life in its fullest rigour seeking to crucify the flesh by fastings macerations and vigils shut up in his cell as in a prison he struggled without intermission against the evil thoughts and evil propensities of his heart a little bread and a herring were often all his food indeed he was naturally very temperate often when he had no thought of purchasing heaven by abstinence have his friends see him content himself with the coarsest provisions and even remain four days in succession without eating or drinking we have this on the testimony of a very credible witness melanchthon and we may judge from it what opinion to form of the fables which ignorance and prejudice have circulated concerning luther's intemperance at the period of which we treat there is no sacrifice he would have declined to make in order to become holy and purchase heaven when luther after he had become reformer says that heaven is not purchased he well knew what he meant truly wrote he to george duke of saxony truly i was a pious monk and followed the rules of my order more strictly than i can tell if ever monk got to heaven by monkery i had been that monk in this all the monks of my acquaintance will bear me witness had the thing continued much longer i had become a martyr unto death through vigils prayer reading and other labours we are touching on the period which made luther a new man and which revealing to him the immensity of the divine love fitted him for proclaiming it to the world the peace which luther had come in search of he found neither in the tranquillity of the cloister nor in monastic perfection he wished to be assured of his salvation it was the great want of his soul and without it he could have no repose but the fears which had agitated him when in the world followed him into his cell nay they were even increased the least cry of his heart raising a loud echo under the silent vaults of the cloister god had brought him thither that he might learn to know himself and to despair of his own strength and virtue his conscience enlightened by the divine word told him what it was to be holy but he was filled with alarm at not finding either in his heart or his life that image of holiness which he had contemplated with admiration in the word of god a sad discovery made by every man who is in earnest no righteousness within no righteousness without everywhere omission sin defilement the more ardent luther's natural disposition was the more strongly he felt the secret and unceasing resistance which human nature opposes to goodness this threw him into despair the monks and theologians of the day invited him to do works in order to satisfy the divine justice but what works thought he can proceed from such a heart as mine how should i be able with works polluted in their very principle to stand in the presence of my holy judge i felt myself says he to be a great sinner before god and deemed it impossible to appease him by my merits he was agitated and at the same time gloomy shunning the silly and coarse conversation of the monks who unable to comprehend the tempests of his soul regarded him with astonishment and reproached him for his gloom and taciturnity 
it is told by cochleus that one day when they were saying mass in the chapel luther had come with his sighs and stood amid the friars in sadness and anguish the priest had already prostrated himself the incense had been placed on the altar the gloria had been chanted and they were reading the gospel when the poor monk no longer able to contain his agony exclaimed in piercing tone while throwing himself on his knees not i not i everyone was in amazement and the service was for a moment interrupted perhaps luther thought he had heard himself reproached with something of which he knew he was innocent perhaps he meant to express his unworthiness to be one of those to whom the death of christ brought eternal life cochleus says that they were reading the passage of scripture which tells of the dumb man out of whom christ expelled a demon if this account is correct luther's cry might have been a reference to this circumstance he might mean to intimate that though dumb like the man it was owing to another cause than the possession of a demon in fact cochleus informs us that the friars sometimes attributed the agonies of their brother to occult commerce with the devil and he himself is of the same opinion a tender conscience led luther to regard the smallest fault as a great sin no sooner had he discovered it than he strove to expiate it by the severest mortifications this however had no other effect than to convince him of the utter inefficacy of all human remedies i tormented myself to death says he in order to procure peace with god to my troubled heart and agitated conscience but surrounded with fearful darkness i nowhere found it the acts of monastic holiness which lulled so many consciences and to which he himself had recourse in his agony soon appeared to luther only the fallacious cures of an empirical and quack religion at the time when i was a monk if i felt some temptation assail me i am lost said i to myself and immediately resorted to a thousand methods in order to suppress the cries of my heart i confessed every day but that did me no good thus oppressed with sadness i was tormented by a multiplicity of thoughts look exclaimed i there you are still envious impatient passionate it is of no use then for you o wretch to have entered this sacred order and yet luther imbued with the prejudices of his day had from his youth up considered the acts whose impotence he now experienced as sure remedies for diseased souls what was he to think of the strange discovery which he had just made in the solitude of the cloister it is possible then to dwell in the sanctuary and still carry within oneself a man of sin he has received another garment but not another heart his hopes are disappointed where is he to stop can it be that all these rules and observances are only human inventions such a supposition appears to him at one time a suggestion of the devil and at another time an irresistible truth struggling alternately with the holy voice which spoke to his heart and with venerable institutions which had the sanction of ages luther's life was a continual combat the young monk like a shade glided through the long passages of the cloister making them echo with his sad groans his body pined away and his strength left him on different occasions he remained as if he were dead once overwhelmed with sadness he shut himself up in his cell and for several days and nights allowed no one to approach him lucas edenberger one of his friends feeling uneasy about the unhappy monk and having some presentiment of the state in which he actually was taking with him several boys who were accustomed to chant in choirs went and knocked at the door of his cell no one opens or answers good edinburgh still more alarmed forces the door luther is stretched on the floor insensible and showing no signs of life his friend tries in vain to revive him but he still remains motionless the young boys begin to chant a soft anthem their pure voices act like a charm on the poor monk who had always the greatest delight in music and he gradually recovers sensation consciousness and life 
but if music could for some moments give him a slight degree of serenity another and more powerful remedy was wanted to cure him effectually that soft and penetrating sound of the gospel which is the voice of god himself he was well aware of this and accordingly his sorrows and alarms led him to study the writings of the apostles and prophets with renewed zeal End of Book 2, Chapter 3「Book Two, Chapter Four of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four Pious Men in Cloisters, Stalpitz, His Piety, His Visitation, Conversation, The Grace of Christ, Repentance, Power of Sin sweetness of repentance election providence the bible the old monk the remission of sins consecration dinner the fete dieu call to wittemberg luther was not the first monk who had passed through similar struggles the cloisters often shrouded within the obscurity of their walls abominable vices at which if they had been brought to light every honest mind would have shuddered but they often also concealed christian virtues which were there unfolded in silence and which if they had been placed before the eyes of the world would have excited admiration these virtues possessed by those who lived only with themselves and with god attracted no attention and were often even unknown to the modest convent within which they were contained leading a life known to god only these humble solitaries fell occasionally into that mystical theology sad malady of noblest minds which formerly constituted the delight of the first monks on the banks of the nile and which uselessly consumes those who fall under its influence still when one of these men happened to be called to an eminent station he there displayed virtues whose salutary influence was long and widely felt the candle being placed on the candlestick gave light to all the house several were awakened by this light and hence those pious souls propagated from generation to generation kept shining like solitary torches at the very time when cloisters were often little better than impure receptacles of the deepest darkness a young man had in this way attracted notice in one of the convents of germany his name was john staupitz and was of a noble family in misnia from his earliest youth having a taste for science and a love of virtue he longed for retirement in order to devote himself to literature but soon finding that philosophy and the study of nature could do little for eternal salvation he began to study theology making it his special object to join practice with knowledge for says one of his biographers it is vain to deck ourselves with the name of theologian if we do not prove our title to the honourable name by our life the study of the bible and of the theology of st augustine the knowledge of himself and the war which he like luther had to wage against the wiles and lusts of his heart led him to the redeemer through faith in whom he found peace to his soul the doctrine of the election of grace had in particular taken a firm hold of his mind integrity of life profound science and eloquence combined with a noble appearance and a dignified address recommended him to his contemporaries the elector of saxony frederick the wise made him his friend employed him on different embassies and under his direction founded the university of wittemberg this disciple of st paul and st augustine was the first dean of the faculty of theology in that school which was one day to send forth light to enlighten the schools and churches of so many nations he attended the council of lateran as deputy from the archbishop of salzburg became provincial of his order in thuringia and saxony and ultimately vicar-general of the augustines all over germany Staupitz lamented the corruption of manners and the errors in doctrine which were laying waste the church 
this is proved by his writings on the love of god on christian faith on resemblance to christ in his death and by the testimony of luther but he considered the former of these evils as greatly the worse of the two besides the mildness and indecision of his character and his desire not to go beyond the sphere of action which he thought assigned to him made him fitter to be the restorer of a convent than the reformer of the church he could have wished to confer important stations only on distinguished men but not finding them he was contented to employ others we must plough with horses said he if we can find them but if we have no horses we must plough with oxen we have seen the anguish and inward wrestlings to which luther was a prey in the convent of erfurt at this time a visit from the vicar-general was announced and staupitz accordingly arrived to make his ordinary inspection the friend of frederick the founder of the university of wittemberg the head of the augustins took a kind interest in the monks under his authority it was not long ere one of the friars of the convent attracted his attention this was a young man of middle stature whom study abstinence and vigils had so wasted away that his bones might have been counted his eyes which at a later period were compared to those of the falcon were sunken his gait was sad and his looks bespoke a troubled soul the victim of numerous struggles yet still strong and bent on resisting his whole appearance had in it something grave melancholy and solemn Staupitz, whose discernment had been improved by long experience easily discovered what was passing in the soul of the young friar and singled him out from those around him he felt drawn towards him had a presentiment of his high destiny and experienced the interest of a parent for his subaltern he too had struggled like luther and could therefore understand his situation above all he could show him the way of peace which he himself had found the information he received of the circumstances which had brought the young augustine to the convent increased his sympathy he requested the prior to treat him with great mildness and availed himself of the opportunities which his office gave him to gain the young friar's confidence going kindly up to him he took every means to remove his timidity which was moreover increased by the respect and reverence which the elevated rank of staupitz naturally inspired the heart of luther till then closed by harsh treatment opened at last and expanded to the mild rays of charity as in water face answereth to face so the heart of man to man the heart of staupitz answered to the heart of luther the vicar-general understood him and the monk in his turn felt a confidence in staupitz which no one had hitherto inspired he revealed to him the cause of his sadness depicted the fearful thoughts which agitated him and then in the cloister of erfurt commenced a conversation full of wisdom and instruction in vain said luther despondingly to staupitz in vain do i make promises to god sin has always the mastery oh my friend replied the vicar-general thinking how it had been with himself more than a thousand times have i sworn to our holy god to live piously and i have never done so now i no longer swear for i know i should not perform unless god be pleased to be gracious to me for the love of christ and grant to me a happy departure when i leave this world i shall not be able with all my vows and all my good works to stand before him i must perish the young monk is terrified at the thought of the divine justice and lays all his fears before the vicar-general the ineffable holiness of god and his sovereign majesty fill him with alarm who will be able to support the day of his advent who to stand when he appeareth staupitz resumes he knows where he has found peace and his young friend will hear it why torment thyself said he to him with all these speculations and high thoughts look to the wounds of jesus christ to the blood which he has shed for thee then thou shalt see the grace of god instead of making a martyr of thyself for thy faults throw thyself into the arms of the redeemer 
confide in him in the righteousness of his life and the expiation of his death keep not back god is not angry with thee it is thou who art angry with god listen to the son of god who became man in order to assure thee of the divine favour he says to thee thou art my sheep thou hearest my voice none shall pluck thee out of my hand but luther does not here find the repentance which he believes necessary to salvation he replies and it is the ordinary reply of agonized and frightened souls how dare i believe in the favour of god while there is nothing in me like true conversion i must be changed before he can receive me his venerable guide shows him that there can be no true conversion while god is dreaded as a severe judge what will you say then exclaims luther of the many consciences to which a thousand unsupportable observances are prescribed as a means of gaining heaven then he hears this reply from the vicar general or rather his belief is that it comes not from man but it is a voice sounding from heaven no repentance says stapitz is true save that which begins with the love of god and of righteousness what others imagine to be the end and completion of repentance is on the contrary only the commencement of it to have a thorough love of goodness thou must before all have a thorough love of god if thou wouldst be converted dwell not upon all these macerations and tortures love him who first loved thee luther listens and listens again these consoling words fill him with an unknown joy and give him new light it is jesus christ thinks he in his heart yes it is jesus christ himself who consoles me so wonderfully by these sweet and salutary words these words in fact penetrated to the inmost heart of the young monk like the sharp arrow of a mighty man in order to repent it is necessary to love god illumined with this new light he proceeds to examine the scriptures searching out all the passages which speak of repentance and conversion these words till now so much dreaded become to use his own expressions an agreeable sport and the most delightful recreation all the passages of scripture which frightened him seem now to rise up from all sides smiling and leaping and sporting with him hitherto exclaims he though i have carefully disguised the state of my heart and strove to give utterance to a love which was only constrained and fictitious scripture did not contain a word which seemed to me more bitter than that of repentance now however there is none sweeter and more agreeable oh how pleasant the precepts of god are when we read them not only in books but in the precious wounds of the saviour meanwhile luther though consoled by the words of stapitz was still subject to fits of depression sin manifested itself anew to his timorous conscience and then the joy of salvation was succeeded by his former despair oh my sin my sin my sin one day exclaimed the young monk in the presence of the vicar-general in accents of the deepest grief ah replied he would you only be a sinner on canvas and also have a saviour only on canvas then stapitz gravely added know that jesus christ is the saviour even of those who are great real sinners and every way deserving of condemnation what agitated luther was not merely the sin which he felt in his heart the upbraidings of his conscience were confirmed by arguments drawn from reason if the holy precepts of the bible frightened him some of its doctrines likewise increased his terror truth which is the great means by which god gives peace to man must necessarily begin by removing the false security which destroys him the doctrine of election in particular disturbed the young man and threw him into a field which it is difficult to traverse must he believe that it was man who on his part first chose god or that it was god who first chose man the bible history daily experience and the writings of augustine had shown him that always and in everything in looking for a first cause it was necessary to ascend to the sovereign will by which everything exists and on which everything depends but his ardent spirit would have gone farther 
he would have penetrated into the secret counsel of god unveiled its mysteries seen the invisible and comprehended the incomprehensible staupitz interfered telling him not to pretend to fathom the hidden purposes of god but to confine himself to those of them which have been made manifest in christ look to the wounds of christ said he to him and there see a bright display of the purposes of god towards man it is impossible to comprehend god outside of jesus christ in christ you will find what i am and what i require saith the lord you can find him nowhere else either in heaven or on the earth the vicar general went farther he convinced luther of the paternal designs of providence in permitting the various temptations and combats which the soul has to sustain he exhibited them to him in a light well fitted to revive his courage by such trials god prepares those whom he destines for some important work the ship must be proved before it is launched on the boundless deep if this education is necessary for every man it is so particularly for those who are to have an influence on their generation this starpitz represented to the monk of erfurt it is not without cause said he to him that god exercises you by so many combats be assured he will employ you in great things as his minister these words which luther hears with astonishment and humility fill him with courage and give him a consciousness of powers whose existence he had not even suspected the wisdom and prudence of an enlightened friend gradually revealed the strong man to himself nor does Staupitz rest here he gives him valuable directions as to his studies exhorting him in future to lay aside the systems of the school and draw all his theology from the bible let the study of the scriptures said he be your favorite occupation never was good advice better followed but what above all delighted luther was the present of a bible from Staupitz perhaps it was the latin bible bound in red leather which belonged to the convent and which it was the summit of his desire to possess that he might be able to carry it about with him wherever he went because all its leaves were familiar to him and he knew where to look for every passage at length this treasure is his own from that time he studies the scriptures and especially the epistles of st paul with always increasing zeal the only author whom he admits along with the bible is st augustine whatever he reads is deeply imprinted on his soul for his struggles had prepared him for comprehending it the soil had been ploughed deep and the incorruptible seed penetrates far into it when staupitz left erfurt a new day had dawned upon luther nevertheless the work was not finished the vicar-general had prepared it but its completion was reserved for a humbler instrument the conscience of the young augustine had not yet found repose and owing to his efforts and the stretch on which his soul had been kept his body at length gave way he was attacked by an illness which brought him to the gates of death this was in the second year of his residence in the convent all his agonies and terrors were awakened at the approach of death his own pollution and the holiness of god anew distracted his soul one day when overwhelmed with despair an old monk entered his cell and addressed him in consoling terms luther opened his heart to him and made him aware of the fears by which he was agitated the respectable old man was incapable of following him into all his doubts as staupitz had done but he knew his credo and having found in it the means of consoling his own heart he could apply the same remedy to the young friar leading him back to the apostles creed which luther had learned in the infancy at the school of mansfeld the old monk good-naturedly repeated the article i believe in the forgiveness of sins these simple words which the pious friar calmly repeated at this decisive moment poured great consolation into the soul of luther i believe oft repeated he to himself on his sick-bed i believe in the forgiveness of sins 
ah said the monk the thing to be believed in is not merely that david's or peter's sins are forgiven this the devils believe god's command is to believe that our own sins are forgiven how delightful this command appeared to poor luther see what st bernard says in his sermon on the annunciation added the old friar the witness which the holy spirit witnesseth with our spirit is thy sins are forgiven thee from this moment light sprung up in the heart of the young monk of erfurt the gracious word has been pronounced and he believes it he renounces the idea of meriting salvation and puts implicit confidence in the grace of god through jesus christ he does not see all the consequences of the principle which he has admitted he is still sincere in his attachment to the church and yet he has no longer need of her he has received salvation immediately from god himself and from that moment roman catholicism is virtually destroyed in him he goes forward and searches the writings of the apostles and prophets for everything that may strengthen the hope which fills his heart each day he invokes help from above and each day also the light increases in his soul the health which his spirit had found soon restores health to his body and he rises from his sick-bed after having in a double sense received a new life during the feast of noel which arrived shortly after he tasted abundantly of all the consolations of faith with sweet emotion he took part in the holy solemnities and when in the middle of the gorgeous service of the day he came to chant these words o beata culpa quoe talem meruisti redemptorem o blessed fault to merit such a redeemer his whole being said amen and thrilled with joy luther had been two years in the cloister and must now be consecrated priest he had received much and he looked forward with delight to the prospect which the priesthood presented of enabling him freely to give what he had freely received wishing to avail himself of the occasion to be fully reconciled to his father he invited him to be present and even asked him to fix the day john luther though not yet entirely appeased nevertheless accepted the invitation and named sabbath the second of may fifteen hundred and seven in the list of luther's friends was the vicar of isenach john braun who had been his faithful adviser when he resided in that town luther wrote to him on the twenty-second of april it is the reformer's earliest letter and bears the following address to john braun holy and venerable priest of christ and mary it is only in the two first letters of luther that the name of mary occurs god who is glorious and holy in all his works says the candidate for the priesthood having designed to exalt me exceedingly me a miserable and every way unworthy sinner and to call me solely out of his abundant mercy to his sublime ministry it is my duty in order to testify my gratitude for a goodness so divine and so magnificent as far at least as dust can do it to fulfil with my whole heart the office which is entrusted to me at length the day arrived the miner of mansfeld failed not to be present at the consecration of his son he even gave him an unequivocal mark of his affection and generosity by making him a present of twenty florins on the occasion the ceremony took place jerome bishop of brandenburg officiating at the moment of conferring on luther the right to celebrate mass he put the chalice into his hand uttering these solemn words acipe potestatum sacrificandi pro vivis et mortuis receive power to sacrifice for the living and the dead luther then listened complacently to these words which gave him the power of doing the very work appropriated to the son of god but they afterwards made him shudder that the earth did not swallow us both said he was more than we deserved and was owing to the great patience and long-suffering of the lord the father afterwards dined at the convent with his son the friends of the young priest and the monks the conversation turned on martin's entrance into the cloister the friars loudly extolling it as one of the most meritorious of works then the inflexible john turning towards his son said to him 
hast thou not read in scripture to obey thy father and thy mother these words struck luther they gave him quite a different view of the action which had brought him into the convent and for a long time continued to echo in his heart by the advice of staupitz luther shortly after his ordination made short excursions on foot into the neighbouring parishes and convents both for relaxation to give his body the necessary exercise and to accustom himself to preaching the fete dieu was to be celebrated with splendour at eisleben where the vicar-general was to be present luther repaired thither he had still need of staupitz and missed no opportunity of meeting with this enlightened conductor who was guiding him into the way of life the procession was numerous and brilliant staupitz himself carried the holy sacrament and luther followed in his sacerdotal dress the thought that it was truly jesus christ that the vicar-general was carrying the idea that christ was there in person actually before him suddenly struck luther's imagination and filled him with such amazement that he could scarcely move forward the perspiration fell from him in drops he shook and thought he would have died with agony and terror at length the procession ceased this host which had so awakened the fears of the monk was solemnly deposited in the sanctuary and luther as soon as he was alone with staupitz threw himself into his arms and told him of his consternation then the worthy vicar-general who had long known that saviour who breaketh not the bruised reed said to him mildly it was not jesus christ my brother jesus christ does not alarm he consoles merely luther was not to remain hid in an obscure convent the time had arrived for his being transported to a larger theatre staupitz with whom he was in constant correspondence was well aware that the soul of the young monk was too active to be confined within so narrow a circle he mentioned him to frederick of saxony and this enlightened prince in fifteen hundred and eight probably towards the close of that year invited him to a chair in the university of wittenberg wittenberg was a field on which he was to fight hard battles and luther felt that his vocation was there being required to repair promptly to his new post he answered the appeal without delay and in the hurry of his removal had not even time to write him whom he called his master and beloved father john braun curate of isenach some months after he wrote my departure was so sudden that those i was living with scarcely knew of it i am far away i confess but the better part of me is still with you luther had been three years in the cloister of erfurt end of book two chapter four book two chapter five of history of the reformation in the sixteenth century volume one by jean henri mel d'aubigne translated by henry beveridge this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the university of wittemberg first employment biblical lectures sensation preaching at wittemberg the old chapel impression in the year fifteen hundred and two the elector frederick had founded a new university at wittemberg declaring in the act by which he confirmed it that he and his people would turn to it as towards an oracle he thought not at the time that these words would be so magnificently realized two men belonging to the opposition which had been formed against the scholastic system that is Pollock of Mellerstadt, doctor of medicine law and philosophy and staupitz had great influence in founding this school the university declared st augustine its patron and even this choice was a presage of good in possession of great freedom and regarded as a tribunal to which in cases of difficulty the supreme decision belonged this new institution which was in every way fitted to become the cradle of the reformation powerfully contributed to the development of luther and his work on his arrival at wittemberg luther repaired to the convent of augustines where a cell was allotted him for though professor he ceased not to be monk 
he was appointed to teach philosophy and dialectics in assigning him these departments regard had no doubt had been to the studies which he had prosecuted at erfurt and to his degree of master of arts thus luther who was hungering and thirsting for the word of life saw himself obliged to give his almost exclusive attention to the scholastic philosophy of aristotle he had need of the bread of life which god gives to the world and he must occupy himself with human subtleties how galling how much he sighed i am well by the grace of god wrote he to braun were it not that i must study philosophy with all my might ever since i arrived at wittemberg i have eagerly desired to exchange this study for that of theology but added he lest it should be thought that he meant the theology of the time the theology i mean is that which seeks out the kernel of the nut the heart of the wheat and the marrow of the bone howbeit god is god continues he with that confidence which was the soul of his life man is almost always deceived in his judgment but he is our god and will conduct us by his goodness for ever and ever the studies in which luther was at this time obliged to engage were afterwards of great service to him in combating the errors of the schoolmen here however he could not stop the desire of his heart must be accomplished the same power which formerly pushed him from the bar into the monastic life now pushed him from philosophy towards the bible he zealously commenced the study of ancient languages especially greek and hebrew that he might be able to draw science and learning at the fountainhead he was all his life an indefatigable student some months after his arrival at the university he applied for the degree of bachelor in divinity and obtained it in the end of march fifteen hundred and nine with a special injunction to devote himself to biblical theology ad biblia every day at one luther had to lecture on the bible a precious employment both for the professor and his pupils giving them a better insight into the divine meaning of those oracles which had so long been lost both to the people and the school he began his lectures with an exposition of the psalms and shortly after proceeded to the epistle to the romans it was especially when meditating upon it that the light of truth entered his heart after retiring to his quiet cell he spent hours in the study of the divine word the epistle of st paul lying open before him one day coming to the seventeenth verse of the first chapter he read these words of the prophet habakkuk the just shall live by faith he is struck with the expression the just then has a different life from other men and this life is given by faith these words which he receives into his heart as if god himself had there deposited them unveils the mystery of the christian life to him and gives him an increase of this life long after in the midst of his numerous labors he thought he still heard a voice saying to him the just shall live by faith luther's lectures thus prepared had little resemblance to those which had hitherto been delivered it was not a declamatory rhetorician or a pedantic schoolman that spoke it was a christian who had felt the power of revealed truth truth which he derived from the bible and presented to his astonished hearers all full of life as it came from the treasury of his heart it was not a lesson from man but a lesson from god this novel exposition of the truth was much talked of the news spread far and wide and attracted a great number of foreign students to the recently founded university even some of the professors attended the lectures of luther among others mellerstadt often surnamed the light of the world he was the first rector of the university and had previously been at leipzig where he had vigorously combated the ridiculous lessons of the schoolmen and denying that the light of the first day of creation could be theology had maintained that this science ought to be based on the study of literature this monk said he will send all the doctors to the right about he will introduce a new doctrine and reform the whole church 
for he founds upon the word of god and no man in the world can either combat or overthrow this word even though he should attack it with all the weapons of philosophy the sophists scotists albertists thomists and the whole fraternity Staupitz, who was the instrument in the hand of providence to unfold the gifts and treasures hidden in luther invited him to preach in the church of the augustines the young professor recoiled at this proposal he wished to confine himself to his academic functions and trembled at the thought of adding to them that of preacher in vain did Staupitz urge him no no replied he it is no light matter to speak to men in the place of god touching humility in this great reformer of the church Staupitz insisted but the ingenious luther says one of his biographers found fifteen arguments pretext and evasions to excuse himself from this calling the chief of the augustines still continuing his attack luther exclaimed ah doctor in doing this you deprive me of life i would not be able to hold out three months very well replied the vicar-general so be it in god's name for up yonder also our lord has need of able and devoted men luther behoved to yield in the middle of the public square of wittemberg was a wooden chapel thirty feet long by twenty wide whose sides propped up in all directions were falling to decay an old pulpit made of fir three feet in height received the preacher in this miserable chapel the preaching of the reformation commenced god was pleased that that which was to establish his glory should have the humblest origin the foundation of the church of the augustines had just been laid and until it should be finished this humble church was employed this building adds the contemporary of luther who relates these circumstances may well be compared to the stable in which christ was born it was in this miserable enclosure that god was pleased so to speak to make his beloved son be born a second time among the thousands of cathedrals and parish churches with which the world abounded there was then only one which god selected for the glorious preaching of eternal life luther preaches and everything is striking in the new preacher his expressive countenance his noble air his clear and sonorous voice captivates the hearers the greater part of preachers before him had sought rather to amuse their auditory than to convert them the great seriousness which predominates in luther's preaching and the joy with which the knowledge of the gospel has filled his heart give to his eloquence at once an authority a fervour and an unction which none of his predecessors had endowed says one of his opponents with a keen and acute intellect and a retentive memory and having an admirable facility in the use of his mother tongue luther in point of eloquence yielded to none of his age discoursing from the pulpit as if he had been agitated by some strong passion and suiting his action to his words he produced a wonderful impression on the minds of his hearers and like a torrent carried them along whithersoever he wished so much force gracefulness and eloquence are seldom seen in the people of the north he had says bossuet a lively and impetuous eloquence which hurried people away and entranced them in a short time the little chapel could not contain the hearers who crowded to it the council of wittemberg then made choice of luther for their preacher and appointed him to preach in the town church the impression which he produced here was still greater the power of his genius the eloquence of his diction and the excellence of the doctrines which he announced equally astonished his hearers his reputation spread far and wide and frederick the wise himself once came to wittemberg to hear him luther had commenced a new life the uselessness of the cloister had been succeeded by great activity the liberty the labour the constant activity to which he could devote himself at wittemberg completely restored his internal harmony and peace he was now in his place and the work of god was soon to exhibit its majestic step end of book two chapter five
Book two, chapter six of History of the Reformation in the Sixteenth Century, Volume One, by Jean Henri Mel d'Aubigne, translated by Henry Beveridge. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six Luther's journey to Rome, a convent on the Po, Luther's behaviour at Rome, corruption of the Romish clergy, prevailing immorality, Pilate's staircase luther was teaching both in his academic chair and in the church when his labours were interrupted in fifteen hundred and ten or according to some not till fifteen eleven or fifteen twelve he was sent to rome seven convents of his order having differed on certain points with the vicar-general the activity of luther's mind the power of his eloquence and his talent for discussion made him be selected to plead the cause of these seven monasteries before the pope this divine dispensation was necessary to luther for it was requisite that he should know rome full of the prejudices and illusions of the cloister he had always represented it to himself as the seat of holiness he accordingly set out and crossed the alps but scarcely had he descended into the plains of rich and voluptuous Italy than he found at every step subjects of astonishment and scandal. The poor German monk was received in a rich convent of Benedictines situated upon the Po in Lombardy. This convent had thirty-six thousand ducats of revenue. Of these, twelve thousand were devoted to the table, twelve thousand to the buildings, and twelve thousand to the other wants of the monks. The gorgeousness of the apartments, the beauty of the dresses, and the rarities of the table all astonished Luther. Marble and silk and luxury under all its forms. How new the sight to the humble friar of the poor convent of Wittenberg! He was astonished and said nothing but when friday came how surprised was he to see abundance of meat still covering the table of the benedictines then he resolved to speak out the church and the pope said he to them forbid such things the benedictines were indignant at this reprimand from the rude german but luther having insisted and perhaps threatened to make their disorders known some of them thought that the simplest plan was to get rid of their troublesome guest the porter of the convent having warned him that he ran a risk in staying longer he made his escape from this epicurean monastery and arrived at bologna where he fell dangerously sick some have seen in this sickness the effects of poison but it is simpler to suppose that it was the effect which a change of living produced in the frugal monk of wittemberg whose principal food was wont to be bread and herrings this sickness was not to be unto death but for the glory of god luther's constitutional sadness and depression again overpowered him to die thus far from germany under this burning sky in a foreign land what a fate the agonies which he had felt at erfurt returned to him with all their force the conviction of his sins troubled while the prospect of the judgment seat of god terrified him but at the moment when these terrors were at the worst the passage of st paul which had struck him at wittemberg the just shall live by faith romans chapter one verse seventeen presented itself to his mind and illumined his soul as with a ray of light from heaven revived and comforted he soon recovered his health and resumed his journey to rome expecting he should find there quite a different life from that of the lombard convents and impatient by the sight of roman holiness to efface the sad impressions which had been left upon his mind by his residence on the po at length after a painful journey under the burning sky of italy in the beginning of summer he drew near to the city of the seven hills his heart was moved and his eyes looked for the queen of the world and of the church as soon as he obtained a distant view of the eternal city the city of st peter and st paul and the metropolis of catholicism he threw himself on the ground exclaiming holy rome i salute thee luther is in rome 
the professor of wittemberg is in the midst of the eloquent ruins of the rome of the consuls and emperors the rome of the confessors and martyrs here lived that plautus and virgil whose works he had taken with him into the cloister and all those great men whose exploits had always caused his heart to beat he perceives their statues and the wrecks of monuments which attest their glory but all this glory and all this power are past and his foot treads on their dust at every step he calls to mind the sad forebodings of scipio shedding tears at the sight of carthage in ruins its burned palaces and broken walls and exclaiming thus too will it be with rome and in fact says luther the rome of the scipios and caesars has been changed into a corpse such is the quantity of ruins that the foundations of the modern houses rest upon the roofs of the old there added he casting a melancholy look on the ruins there were the riches and treasures of the world all this rubbish which he strikes with his foot tells luther within the walls of rome herself that which is strongest in the eyes of men is easily destroyed by the breath of the lord but he remembers that with profane ashes holy ashes are mingled the burial place of the martyrs is not far from that of the generals and triumphing heroes of rome and christian rome with her sufferings has more power over the heart of the saxon monk than pagan rome with her glory it was here the letter arrived in which paul wrote the just is justified by faith and not far off is the appii forum and the three taverns there was the house of narcissus here the palace of caesar where the lord delivered the apostle from the mouth of the lion oh what fortitude these recollections give to the heart of the monk of wittemberg rome then presented a very different aspect the pontifical chair was occupied by the warlike julius the second and not by leo the tenth as it has been said by some distinguished historians of germany no doubt through oversight luther often told an anecdote of this pope when news was brought him of the defeat of his army by the french before ravenna he was reading his hours he dashed the book upon the ground and said with a dreadful oath very well so you have turned frenchman is this the way in which you protect your church then turning in the direction of the country to whose aid he meant to have recourse he exclaimed holy Switzer, pray for us ignorance levity and dissoluteness a profane spirit a contempt of all that is sacred and a shameful traffic in divine things such was the spectacle which that unhappy city presented and yet the pious monk continued for some time in his illusions having arrived about the feast of st john he hears the romans about him repeating a proverb which was then common among the people happy said they is the mother whose son says a mass on the eve of st john oh how i could like to make my mother happy said luther the pious son of margaret accordingly sought to say a mass on that day but could not the press was too great ardent and simple-hearted he went up and down visiting all the churches and chapels believing all the lies that were told him and devoutly performing the requisite acts of holiness happy in being able to do so many pious works which were denied to his countrymen oh how much i regret said the pious german to himself that my father and mother are still alive what delight i should have had in delivering them from the fire of purgatory by my masses my prayers and many other admirable works he had found the light but the darkness was still far from being entirely banished from his understanding his heart was changed but his mind was not fully enlightened he possessed faith and love but not knowledge it was work of no small difficulty to escape from the dark night which had for so many ages covered the earth luther repeatedly said mass at rome taking care to do it with all the unction and dignity which the service seemed to him to require but how grieved was the heart of the saxon monk at seeing the profane formality of the roman priests in celebrating the sacrament of the altar the priests on their part laughed at his simplicity 
one day when he was officiating he found that at the altar next to him seven masses had been read before he got through a single one get on get on cried one of the priests to him make haste and send our lady back her son making an impious allusion to the transubstantiation of the bread into the body and blood of jesus christ on another occasion luther had only got as far as the gospel when the priest beside him had finished the whole mass on on said his companion make haste make haste are ye ever to have done his astonishment was still greater when in the dignitaries of the church he discovered the same thing that he had found in common priests he had hoped better of them it was fashionable at the papal court to attack christianity and in order to pass for a complete gentleman absolutely necessary to hold some erroneous or heretical opinion on the doctrines of the church when erasmus was at rome they had attempted to prove to him by passages from pliny that there was no difference between the soul of man and that of the brutes and young courtiers of the pope maintained that the orthodox faith was merely the result of crafty inventions by some saints luther's employment as envoy of the augustins of germany caused him to be invited to several meetings of distinguished ecclesiastics one day in particular he happened to be at table with several prelates who frankly exhibited themselves to him in their mountebank manners and profane conversation and did not scruple to commit a thousand follies in his presence no doubt believing him to be of the same spirit as themselves among other things they related in the presence of the monk laughing and making a boast of it how when they were saying mass instead of the sacramental words which should transform the bread and wine into the saviour's flesh and blood they parodied them and said panis es et panis manebis vinum es et vinum manebis bread thou art and bread wilt remain wine thou art and wine wilt remain then continued they we raise the ostensorium and all the people worship it luther could scarcely believe his ears his spirit which was lively and even gay in the society of his friends was all gravity when sacred things were in question he was scandalized at the profane pleasantries of rome i was said he a young monk grave and pious and these words distressed me greatly if they speak thus in rome at table freely and publicly thought i to myself what will it be if their actions correspond to their words and if all pope cardinals courtiers say mass in the same style and i who have devoutly heard so large a number read how must i have been deceived luther often mingled with the monks and the citizens of rome if some extolled the pope and his court the great majority gave free utterance to their complaints and their sarcasms what tales they told of the reigning pope of alexander the sixth and of many others one day his roman friends told him how caesar borgia after having fled from rome was apprehended in spain when they were going to try him he pleaded guilty in prison and requested a confessor a monk having been sent he slew him and wrapping himself up in his cloak made his escape i heard that at rome and it is quite certain said luther one day passing through a public street which led to st peter's he stopped in amazement before a statue representing a pope under the form of a woman holding a sceptre clad in the papal mantle and carrying an infant in her arms it is a girl of mentz said they to him whom the cardinals chose for pope and who had a child at this spot hence no pope ever passes through this street i am astonished said luther how the popes allow the statue to remain luther had expected to find the edifice of the church in strength and splendour but its gates were forced and its walls consumed with fire he saw the desolations of the sanctuary and started back in dismay he had dreamed of nothing but holiness and he discovered nothing but profanation he was not less struck with the disorders outside the churches the roman police says he is strict and severe 
the judge or captain every night makes a round of the town on horseback with three hundred attendants and arrests every person he finds in the streets if he meets any one armed he hangs him up or throws him into the tiber and yet the city is full of disorder and murder whereas when the word of god is purely and rightly taught peace and order are seen to reign and there is no need of law and its severities it is almost incredible what sins and infamous actions are committed at rome says he on another occasion one would require to see it and hear it in order to believe it hence it is an ordinary saying that if there is a hell rome is built upon it it is an abyss from whence all sins proceed this sight made a strong impression on luther's mind at the time and the impression was deepened at a later period the nearer we approach rome the more bad christians we find said he several years after there is a common saying that he who goes to rome the first time seeks a rogue the second time finds him and the third time brings him away with him in his own person but now people are become so skilful that they make all the three journeys in one a genius one of the most unhappily celebrated but also one of the most profound in italy machiavelli who was living at florence when luther passed through it on his way to rome has made the same remark the strongest symptom says he of the approaching ruin of christianity he means roman catholicism is that the nearer you come to the capital of christendom the less you find of the christian spirit the scandalous examples and crimes of the court of rome are the cause why italy has lost every principle of piety and all religious sentiment we italians continues the great historian are chiefly indebted to the church and the priests for our having become a set of profane scoundrels at a later period luther was fully aware how much he had gained by his journey i would not take a hundred thousand florins said he not to have seen rome the journey was also of the greatest advantage to him in a literary view like reuchlin luther availed himself of his residence in italy to penetrate farther into the knowledge of the holy scriptures he took lessons in hebrew from a celebrated rabbi named elias levita and thus at rome partly acquired the knowledge of that divine word under whose blows rome was destined to fall but there was another respect in which the journey was of great importance to luther not only was the veil torn away and the sardonic smile and mountebank infidelity which lurked behind the roman superstitions revealed to the future reformer but moreover the living faith which god had implanted in him was powerfully strengthened we have seen how he at first entered devotedly into all the vain observances to which as a price the church has annexed the expiation of sins one day among others wishing to gain an indulgence which the pope had promised to every one who should on his knees climb up what is called pilate's stair the saxon monk was humbly crawling up the steps which he was told had been miraculously transported to rome from jerusalem but while he was engaged in this meritorious act he thought he heard a voice of thunder which cried at the bottom of his heart as at wittenberg and bologna the just shall live by faith these words which had already on two different occasions struck him like the voice of an angel of god resounded loudly and incessantly within him he rises up in amazement from the steps along which he was dragging his body horrified at himself and ashamed to see how far superstition has abased him he flies far from the scene of his folly in regard to this mighty word there is something mysterious in the life of luther it proved a creating word both for the reformer and for the reformation it was by it that god then said let light be and light was it is often necessary that a truth in order to produce its due effect on the mind must be repeatedly presented to it luther had carefully studied the epistle to the romans and yet though justification by faith is there taught he had never seen it so clearly now he comprehends the righteousness which alone can stand in the presence of god now he receives from god himself 
by the hand of christ that obedience which he freely imputes to the sinner as soon as he humbly turns his eye to the god man who was crucified this is the decisive period in the internal life of luther the faith which has saved him from the terrors of death becomes the soul of his theology his fortress in all dangers the stamina of his discourse the stimulant of his love the foundation of his peace the spur of his labours his consolation in life and in death but this great doctrine of a salvation which emanates from god and not from man was not only the power of god to save the soul of luther it also became the power of god to reform the church a powerful weapon which the apostles wielded a weapon too long neglected but at length brought forth in its primitive lustre from the arsenal of the mighty god at the moment when luther stood up in rome all moved and thrilling with the words which paul had addressed fifteen centuries before to the inhabitants of this metropolis truth till then a fettered captive within the church rose up also never again to fall here we must let luther speak for himself although i was a holy and irreproachable monk my conscience was full of trouble and anguish i could not bear the words justice of god i loved not the just and holy god who punishes sinners i was filled with secret rage against him and hated him because not satisfied with terrifying us his miserable creatures already lost by original sin with his law and the miseries of life he still further increased our torment by the gospel but when by the spirit of god i comprehended these words when i learned how the sinner's justification proceeds from the pure mercy of the lord by means of faith then i felt myself revive like a new man and entered as open doors into the very paradise of god from that time also i beheld the precious sacred volume with new eyes i went all over the bible and collected a great number of passages which taught me what the work of god was and as i had previously with all my heart hated the words justice of god so from that time i began to esteem and love them as words most sweet and most consoling in truth these words were to me the true gate of paradise accordingly when called on solemn occasions to confess this doctrine luther always manifested his enthusiasm and rude energy i see said he on a critical occasion that the devil is incessantly attacking this fundamental article by the instrumentality of his doctors and that in this respect he cannot rest or take any repose very well i dr martin luther unworthy evangelist of our lord jesus christ hold this article that faith alone without works justifies in the sight of god and i declare that the emperor of the romans the emperor of the turks the emperor of the tartars the emperor of the persians the pope all the cardinals bishops priests monks nuns princes and nobles all men and all devils must let it stand and allow it to remain for ever if they will undertake to combat this truth they will bring down the flames of hell upon their heads this is the true and holy gospel and the declaration of me dr luther according to the light of the holy spirit nobody continues he has died for our sins but jesus christ the son of god i repeat it once more should the world and all the devils tear each other and burst with fury this is nevertheless true and if it be he alone who takes away sin it cannot be ourselves with our works but good works follow redemption as the fruit appears on the tree this is our doctrine and it is the doctrine which the holy spirit teaches with all true christians we maintain it in the name of god amen it was thus luther found what all doctors and reformers even the most distinguished had to a certain degree at least failed to discover it was in rome that god gave him this clear view of the fundamental doctrine of christianity he had come to the city of the pontiffs seeking the